So, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Larry. Thank you all for having me here and pre present you possibly, um, you know, a, a combined perspective on clinical decision support in an area that we've been working for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so just to briefly describe who I am, I am Tanvir Sayada Mahmood. I lead the Medical Civ Radiology Grand Challenge at IBM Research. To tell you what grand challenges are in IBM Research, these are long-range exploratory research initiatives that IBM takes, and IBM Research being the think tank or the academic wing of IBM, where we look for the next generation of uh, research and technologies to change the f fields, many of the fields, including now the field of medicine. So um, the last grand challenge, as you may have heard, was the Watson Jeopardy Challenge, which uh, advanced the realms of natural language understanding. And, uh, and you could think of this as the follow-on to that, where you are trying to give eyes to Watson and trying to look at uh, this field of radiology and cardiology. So that's where I'm coming from. These are long-range 50 to $100 million initiatives, which hope to result in billion-dollar businesses for us and others in future. So hopefully trying to change the field there. So what I'm going to talk about today is, however, my perspective on what clinical decision support is and the role of machine learning. As you will see over here, the, the perspective I'm taking from machine learning is a bit broader than what is traditionally called machine learning, and I hope to give you this perspective. Uh, just as a disclaimer, I am not going to be able to review everybody's work in this area or cite uh, the most relevant work, perhaps, and I apologize for that already. I, I had uh, too much to cover, so I hope to give you a glimpse of the, uh, the range of techniques over here and how uh, they have helped me personally in my research and in my colleagues' research as well. So here's how we will go around this particular area. So first of all, what is clinical decision support? When I started working in this area back in early 2000s, it was very difficult to pin it down. There seemed to be so many definitions in, depending on where you're coming from. So the most popular seems to be about eventually resulting in recommendations of different kinds, whether it is diagnosis or dosages or treatments or referrals and so on. And in that sense, we have our flagship Watson which is, uh, as you know, is now in oncology and is trying to uh, team up with Memorial Sloan Kettering at one end of oncology and MD Anderson at the other end of oncology to give you practice uh, recommendations for treatments and so on using practice guidelines and uh, information mined from uh, scientific literature. So that's one perspective. Now we are also looking at imaging and recommendations from a um, the differential diagnosis perspective in our own project, and I'll talk a bit more about this. And this is particularly showing in the case of breast radiology, where you could uh, do a differential diagnosis of possible findings. Um, now, when you look at computer-aided diagnosis, that's another perspective to put in here. And, and here as a represents some of the latest work that is going on, and now not necessarily diagnostic imaging, but actually camera-grabbed imaging, and in particular in skin cancer detection. This is the work that is being done out of other IBM labs of Watson and Melbourne um, that is um, being teamed up with Memorial Sloan Kettering again. Um, so there is also companies now that are trying to offer analytic services that do computer-aided diagnosis as if over a cloud and, and provide these diagnostic services. Uh, Hyatt Greenspan in our community over here has started RedLogix, and you can see uh, their work being described here as well. Okay, so now we, come, we came to our cl clinical decision support from a slightly different perspective. When we started this work, um, it was to look at, uh, again, uh, offering recommendations, but when we tried to experiment this with actual clients, we found that they were not necessarily interested in recommendations first. What they wanted was the ability to do a holistic overview of patients. So as you can see over here, there is a, um, um, the system offers a summarized perspective of what uh, the cardiac conditions are, are over the last 16 years of clinical history of a patient. Uh, so this was the work that started in a project called Alum, which also introduced the notion of patient similarity, and I will talk a little bit more about this. So overall, it seems like clinical decision support has different perspectives to come from, 
And if you look at uh, what is uh, happening in the field, and if you look back at how it started, we see it as a confluence of at least four different directions coming from, first of all, by looking at a variety of data sets. Initially, they started off with structured clinical representations, but now we are moving on to textual and imaging and multimodal data. Um, there is um, a, a, a heavy role played by inference algorithms from all the AI days, as well as the advancements that have been happening in reasoning algorithms since then. There is a strong focus from what is traditionally called machine learning, and we will look at this perspective as well. And finally, we introduce a new perspective on it, which combines some of these areas in the, uh, in the context of patient similarity and brings them all together to a new type of reasoning with a paradigm for clinical decision support called multimodal reasoning. And if you look at uh, what constitutes a decision support system, it seems initially there were, um, there were, um, uh, okay, I need to get back. Okay, um, so, so the, uh, primarily doing from structured data and clinical guidelines and using inference engines. Then they moved on to ha adding, looking at data and trying to mine data in order to infer uh, content and then uh, also on to patient similarity. So let's look at, at the, essentially the landscape of the clinical decision support techniques. The top three approaches in terms of dichotomy, I would say, are inference, machine learning, and patient similarity as something we introduce. Now here I've cited a few major categories of work going on in this area. This is obviously not exhaustive, but just to tell you how the trends are. So for example, artificial neural networks were introduced for clinical decision support back in early 90s or even earlier than that, but now you see a resurgence of them as transformation through deep learning techniques. Decision trees were started off in AI, and uh, for, from a reasoning perspective, but now they've evolved into random forests and multi-layer random forests as we go along. Um, metric learning techniques, which initially started off from machine learning for clustering, actually evolved also to um, look for similar patients and guide the patient similarity work as you go along. So there is a lot of work happening in this space, and all of them are now converging to utilizing the best of the, all of these fields as you go to multimodal reasoning. In particular, uh, we helped pioneer this field of patient similarity, and I wanted to give you, run to you a video we did back in early 90s, 1997 perhaps, in which we introduced this concept for the point of view of multimodal clinical decision support, and let me give you that perspective. In current clinical practice, physicians diagnose based on evidence from a single patient and their own prior experience. What if physicians could leverage the experience of their peers who have looked at similar patients? What if they could exploit diagnostic patterns from similar patient statistics? Statistically guided decision support lets physicians see consensus opinions as well as differing alternatives, helping reduce the uncertainty associated with diagnosis. In the long run, this could lower diagnostic errors and improve the quality of care. The key to statistical decision support is finding similar patients based on their associated electronic health records. Health records today have become multimodal, including images, video, text, and charts. Alim is a decision support system that analyzes multiple modalities to identify similar patient records. Alam then summarizes similar patient outcomes through easy to read reports and visualizations. Current work in Alam has focused on the domain of cardiology. Sophisticated feature extraction and search techniques have been developed to find similar patients based on a disease specific analysis of their heart sounds, EKGs, and echocardiogram videos. Consider now a glimpse of echocardiograms being analyzed by Alam. During an echocardiographic exam, an ultrasound device captures video from a number of views of the heart. Alam's first processing step is to divide the video into clips showing views of interest. From a given view of the heart, we next extract heart shape and motion, as these features can be used to identify 
a number of cardiovascular diseases. To represent shape, an active shape model automatically locates heart wall boundaries. The model contains both shape and texture components, and it can deform both rigidly and non-rigidly. To fit a new image, first a rough alignment is made, followed by a non-rigid fitting. When applied to video of the cardiac cycle, the model can track heart features over time. By identifying regions of similar motion, the motion of the heart itself can be used to segment different heart chambers. Region measurements, such as the area of the left ventricle, can then be tracked over the cardiac cycle. Finally, these features are used to match or discriminate diseases. The patient on the left suffers from hypokinesia, a condition where the heart has a reduced motion, and on the right, a normal patient. Plotting the displacement of the septal wall and measuring its motion over the cardiac cycle, the two cases can be distinguished or similar cases matched. In general, Alam will combine echocardiogram features with features from other modalities to match patients based on disease similarity. Alam's main search output, similar patient records and consensus diagnoses, will be integrated into future EMR systems to provide better clinical decision support for physicians. Across the world, medical records are going online. Advances in healthcare interoperability are seamlessly integrating these resources. Alim untaps the medical diagnostic knowledge and medical records through novel search techniques, helping to revolutionize decision support. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a glimpse of about 10 or so years ago what we had done in this space. Um, now the latest work we're doing is in the medical civ project and we'll come to that later. Okay, so I'm going to do a very quick review of the techniques as we go through so people have a wider perspective and then get into what we are doing the in, from the latest and greatest. So, so looking at the inference-based approaches, if you remember I said inference approaches, machine learning approaches, patient similarity approaches. So if you look at the inference-based approaches, they are all, that is how the field started back in the days of Meissen when you wanted to do rule-based, uh, you used to handcraft rules and then try to infer from rules using uh, um, you know, first order logic and so on uh, from an if then else rules point of view, uh, predicate logic and first order logic. But as, um, as the field went on, the rules were uh, incomplete, they did not apply in a particular situation, so those things essentially petered out and you didn't actually see rollout of clinical decision support systems in hospitals. What did make through was alerts that you now see in EMR systems, guidelines, practice guidelines, and a lot of information on UpToDate and WebMD and other Medscape and other sources out there that people are using from a browsing perspective. But from an actionable uh, information that takes both the clinical knowledge and the data, there isn't that much available in practice today. So um, initially they started off with also trying the ways of representing clinical knowledge in the various forms such as semantic networks. The latest rendition of this is also now in the knowledge graph activity and uh, uh, semantic uh, graph expansions that are going on in the AI community. We ourselves have worked uh, in this particular area in particular using a property graph representation of graph no uh, clinical knowledge from uh, uh, all the available reference medical sources we have now, and this is part of the medical system. Um, the, the decision trees initially started off as where you could do, uh, essentially start with the fixed feature sets, and you want then to be able to uh, make decisions at each of the nodes. Most of the, the most basic conditions were things derived from chi-square type of um, statistics, but later on there were many other algorithms that have evolved over there, such as C4.5, ID3, and so on. Um, um, so, so there again, there was Bayesian networks that were popular in a variety of uh, ways, and many different variants came, both dynamic as well as static Bayesian networks for doing reasoning in the area of clinical decision support. Then came neural networks, where the concept of input hidden and output layers was around for quite some time and they were used for many different um, uh, tasks, including uh, such as in this particular reference, uh, 
uh, to be able to assess um, well-being in diabetes cases. Um, okay, so those were the inference-based methods. As you can, as I will review the machine learning, you will see that there is progressive variants of these coming up where many of the problems that face them, such as in this particular case, the learning of these networks and the ability to explain and all have evolved over time. Um, then, uh, so in the realm of machine learning, most people think of machine learning as clustering and classification. As you'll see, there's a few more things to those. But looking at clustering, the work uh, in clinical decision support from a, for, from a clustering point of view was trying to look at patient populations and see if we can form groups of things. But when it comes down to uh, actually a, using it in a multimodal fashion, clustering can also help you identify structures in high dimensional spaces. So this was one such work where motion and spatial information was used to segment echocardiograms in one of our earlier works. Whereas if you exploit the structural information present in, cluster, uh, in, the, in the clustering space, you will get a much better segmentation as shown in here over just using them purely from any other neighborhood distances such as this method. Um, that, is, that was one of the popular methods in those days. Okay. So that was on uh, a clustering perspective. Again, I'm doing a whirlwind tour, so people have got to get uh, an idea of the space involved. So when you do clustering, there is also a lot of information about how one can project into a relevant dimension so that the distances preserve the meaningful separation between them. And this is where the techniques of metric learning came about, where you want to be able to project to dimensions to better separate the data sets. Here's an example taken from Eric Schink's work back in NIPS where he showed a good example of how the separation is done through metric learning, where the, what is the space to project itself is learned. And this becomes important when you try to do patient uh, comparisons, as we, I will describe later for patient similarity. So you can see over here that projecting into this space resolves these clusters better. Um, okay, so then came the support vector machine uh, variants, the classification methods which everybody is familiar with and pro very popularly used. And there, as you know, the idea is to be able to separate the data set. It initially started off as a binary, but now we have multi-class variants and so on. And then trying to figure out a way to, do, um, to find a hyperplane that separates them. But the hyperplane could be uh, in, in a space that is formed from kernels, and many of the kernel-based approaches have come along. Uh, in terms of, uh, it is of widespread use in uh, CAD, and I will give you a specific example that, where we have used this uh, shortly. Um, I just wanted to say that there is so many, so, so many variants of this that it becomes very confusing which ones to select and so on. But one of these things I want to point out is some of the techniques that have, we have found useful in particularly in clinical decision support when there is a, a, the ambiguity in the interpretation, particularly what disease a patient has or a patient could have simultaneously many diseases is the framework of ambiguous learning where you now, instead of solving the zero one loss function that you'd see in support vector machines, you do an ambiguous loss function, which is called the surrogate loss function over here. And this is one such work from CVPR uh, that has become popular for use in uh, ground truthing of data sets as well. Um, so just sh to show you how support vector machines could use, so here's a case where you look at a heart and your left ventricle and you try to determine whether it is normal or abnormal. For those who are cardiologists in the audience, perhaps they can tell you whether that's normal. Is that normal? Is that normal? Or is that normal? Of these, there was only one that was normal, and that was this one, which had normal bullet-like appearance of a left ventricle. So how can we describe suitable features? How can we extract from here suitable features so we could learn the separation between normal and abnormal? So what we developed was to, again, going after cardiologists, trying to listen to what they say about how they interpret these uh, shapes, and then uh, trying to represent the bullet itself as a prolate spheroidal function, and then take deviations from the appearance of a prolate spheroid as a measure of how abnormal the left ventricle is. And this method, uh, of course, requ requires you to localize the left ventricle first, which is what we do with the multi-level thresholding approach approximate, locate the uh, left ventricle through the apex of the heart, and then actually extract the regions and then try to fit prolate spheroids. So based on that, we were able to fit prolate spheroids to normal and abnormal shapes, and just using support vector machine with radial basis function kernels, we were able to do about 82% accuracy, and this was published in last year's ISB. Um, 
Okay, so now we come to ensemble learning techniques. Here the idea is to be able to uh, use a variety of weak learners to actually improve and make a good learner. And you can say, how does that work? So if you can think of these are all the weak learners, you can see that the pattern that is emerging overall is a good learner. So that's kind of the idea that is used in Adaboost and var many variants of Adaboost have been used in the past. We ourselves have actually come forward with a uh, technique uh, called uh, um, predictive space aggregated regression, which is a method we use to actually jointly learn the, uh, um, the fact that there might be errors in the data and errors in the, um, 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 in the learners themselves and how do we combine them. So the technique is called predictive space aggregated regression and basically what it does is tries to assign weights to the learners and the data and factorize the weights so you can actually do a combination of the two. So that's kind of uh, the idea there. And the, the terms that you saw before were essentially regularization terms. So that's the uh, objective function that is used, where you use a data fidelity term, a data space regularization term, and a prediction space regularization to do the learn. So this beat the state of the art and add a boost and other, and as well as caviar variant from Mikai to, uh, to become the state of the art for uh, ensemble type of learning for classification. And the task we attempted there was for Doppler um, disease classification from CW Doppler imaging. And this is a paper from ISB uh, a couple of years ago. All right, so now we come to random forest. I mentioned to you that decision trees were used, and one of the main limitations for decision trees is how do you sample your data set in order to push it down the decision tree, and what sort of decisions can you make at each of these? Now, random forest came as variants of this idea where you could randomize the choice of samples as well as the decision of which feature to select in order to make the uh, um, split. And so many variants of decision trees are also around. The advantage of this over other um, methodologies that are seen in clinical decision support is now you can actually point it to a feature and therefore have some semantic connotations of how the machine came up with an answer. And this is very, quite popular with clinicians. Um, we've been working on variants of this following these ideas of deep learning, but bringing it back to random forests as well, and then trying to introduce multiple layers in random forests, and, um, and in some sense make random forest as a future fusion uh, approach itself. And this is some of the latest work you'll see in ISBE this year in using uh, it for the purpose of fracture diagnosis, uh, looking at uh, a future fusion approach to do a multi-layer random forest and then showing the results for uh, many types of fractures, both simple and compound fracture classifications. All right, so now we come to deep learning, which I think everybody is hoping to hear as machine learning is deep learning. There's a lot of buzz around it. People ask about uh, you know, what is deep learning and so on. Of course, everybody knows it's a neural network trying to make a comeback. And what made them stick this time was uh, fast GPU processors that can explore parallel paths as well as uh, and an interesting way in which you can do the decision making at each of these nodes that is also very visually guided. In particular, in computer vision, the convolution, convolutional neural nets are very popular. And, and the basic dichotomy you see over here is should we do feature engineering or not? Many in support, when people use support vector machines or random forest, they did worry a lot about what features to extract from images or your particular data sets in order to do classification well. And we knew that the, the better the features, the better the learners. This one is taking a departure from the saying, it's okay, you can just choose uh, the raw images and then have the machine learn the features. So in some sense, now the learners have become feature generation engines as such. Uh, but are they really relevant for medical imaging? And one has to take a pause here because uh, most of these have been applied for uh, direct image classification. And many times what we are looking for in medical imaging are very small changes in minute regions that takes a very trained eye. So um, unless we have very large data sets, which from Larry's thing is, is a major hassle is trying to generate such data sets, are we ready for them as yet? I actually had uh, some fun playing this by feeding this to uh, the CAFE. Uh, people know about CAFE, the, the Berkeley uh, software for uh, running deep learning. I gave it a cardiac CT image showing a case of uh, pulmonary embolism, and here's what it annotated it as. So I would have said at least dark something. <laughs> as a semantics, but this is kind of what it gets. Obviously, it's not to blame the cafe, but it was not trained on this data set, and it shows you the value of 
feeding the right data sets as well um, and deriving features appropriately. Okay, so now we move on to the third approach, which is the patient similarity guided approach. Here, we are trying to learn metrics automatically. So in patient similarity, the idea is similar clinical data points to similar patients. And then from once you have similar patients, you can infer from them similarity in diagnosis, treatment, and outcome, possibly simply by using a collaborative filtering-like approach. So this kind of scalable approach has worked for e-commerce of many kinds. When you buy a book in machine learning, you get other recommended books uh, that other people have read and so on. So it's a very popular methodology. We brought that to the field of clinical decision support. But the, again, there are at least two different ways of approaching patient similarity. One is the supervised approach, where you have the clinicians take a pair of patients and say, are they similar or not? And then use that to learn the metric, what makes them similar. And this is the approach then uh, explored by colleagues in Watson Labs. And they have, in fact, turned this into a product now. And, uh, and, is, uh, and is being used for um, care pathway planning and many other applications, as you can see over here. Um, but when you look at that, the question comes is, in, in doing this kind of similarity, you are basically, um, I'm lo losing the title over here. So uh, you are basically trying to make the assumption that all modalities and all features are similar, and then you are basically getting them into a similarity matrix and trying to load such matrix and solve for that matrix. So this can be compute intensive, obviously, but there's also this question of, is it okay to f combine these uh, uh, modalities uh, uh, through common feature spaces? So what makes two EKGs similar uh, versus what makes two angiograms similar may not be the same metric. So allowing for different metrics to be developed and, and then do a late fusion is what is the approach we explored in Alum Clinical Decision Support, where we use the time-varying nature of these similarities across patient timelines in order to actually do the integration of the um, similarities returned by multiple cues, such as from electrocardiograms or echocardiograms, in order to do similarity. So here are some examples. You can see we had techniques for just knowing which electrocardiograms are similar. And here you can see that a patient that started off with a uh, case of bundle, right bundle branch block in the left. Actually, the top patients retrieved are all bundle branch blocks based on the morphological patterns of the electrocardiograms. Similarly, in the Doppler, the top one shows a case of aortic valve regurgitation, and we were able to extract features from the Doppler regions and then reason with their morphological shapes to find similar electrocardiograms as you go along. Okay, so those are from the point of view of uh, looking at the different techniques in clinical decision support, you've seen the inference-based approaches, the machine learning approaches, the patient similarities, which also use machine learning as a methodology to develop similarity techniques. Um, they, uh, those are the spectrum. So where are we going next as we go along? So here comes the, our medical fifth grand challenge, where we are taking the perspective that the best way to influence clinical decision making is to become the resistance for radiologists and cardiologists and in general clinicians. So you can think of this as a resident intern that goes ahead of the clinicians in a teaching hospital, collects all the necessary information about the patient, and then uh, summarizes them in a form that is uh, easy for the clinician to take the next set of actions as you go along. So in order to do that, we have to solve three sets of main problems. Of course, in order to get, be good at doing this, you have to have a wide coverage of the field. So we are talking about 13 radiology specialities and cardiology specialities, so developing diagnostic interpretation capabilities at the level of an entry-level radiologist is going to be important for the machine to develop that capability, first of all. So this is a huge challenge in itself. Uh, we also have to equip it with a lot of clinical knowledge uh, in a variety, the wide variety of fields, and this is also an effort that is underway. And finally, we need to be able to combine patient data with clinical knowledge in order to do the interpretation. So what does this involve? I'm going to illustrate that by a work which shows how we can do the next level of disease understanding in clinical decision support by combining information from multiple modalities, adding clinical knowledge, and then do a diagnostic interpretation. So let me run that video. As a cognitive assistant to clinicians in the future, Medical Sieve needs to have a strong disease understanding. Let's focus on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as an example disease. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a relatively common form of genetic heart disease and is the most frequent cause of sudden cardiac death in the young. 
It is generally characterized by a segment of the cardiac muscle tissue that is abnormally thick. The clinical guidelines characterize pathologic hypertrophy as a wall thickness greater than 15 millimeters. The disease affects one out of every 250 to 500 individuals. Patients with this disease generally present with symptoms ranging from dizziness to sudden death. The cardiac wall thickening can be seen in either cardiac ultrasound or MRI. When a patient presents to a clinician with a potential cardiac condition, the first steps are to get the patient's medical history and perform a physical exam. Based on these findings, the clinician orders a cardiac ultrasound. After the imaging is acquired, the cardiologist will review the findings following a series of steps. First, the modality and orientation of the heart are recognized. The anatomy of interest must then be localized. Potential regions of pathology are identified and measured in order to determine if hypertrophy is present. Echocardiography has some limitations due to the acoustic window for visualizing structures and a tendency to underestimate wall thickness. Also, some subtypes of hypertrophy are not always well seen on echo. As a result, an MRI may subsequently be performed to verify the findings. The radiologist then performs similar measurements to those done in ultrasound. These methods can be tedious for a physician and measurements acquired may have interuser variability. The medical sieve system follows a similar process to clinicians but is able to provide more consistent measurements utilizing a patient's clinical and imaging data with clinical knowledge. In ultrasound analysis, for example, we can now automatically identify the viewpoint from which an echocardiogram recording is taken through the use of active shape models. Matching the model to a given image also gives the location and orientation of the left ventricular region. Using the knowledge of the location of the septal wall relative to the left ventricle in the model, we can localize the intraventricular septum. It can be normalized using the orientation information and segmented from the background to measure the septal wall width. Plotting the width variation along the wall, we notice that the width exceeds 15 millimeters. Looking up our clinical knowledge for allowable ranges for the IVS width, we notice that this is a case of intraseptal hypertrophy. To confirm these findings, the gold standard of cardiac MRI is then performed. In MRI, the challenges for automatic analysis are the presence of other organs in the image that may have similar appearance and the diversity of heart shapes across different image slices. The first task for automated analysis is to localize the myocardium, which is the heart muscle. This is done by localizing the blood pool using a multi-level threshold and appearance characteristics. The final inner wall boundary is found by smoothing the convex hull of the blood pool. Once the inner wall is localized, the outer wall can be identified using a region growing method. From the boundaries, wall widths can be identified around the entire myocardium. Adopting the guidelines of the American Heart Association, the SEAB uses a 17-segment model to automatically divide the myocardium into distinct regions for localization. The vertical slice position is identified by localizing the papillary muscles. Plotting the myocardial wall width within these segments and using clinical knowledge on wall width ranges for normal cases, we again notice mild hypertrophy. Utilizing the 17-segment model, we can further localize the disease to the infraoceptal and anterior segments. With sophisticated medical image processing, advanced shape analysis, and machine learning combined with advanced clinical knowledge from the latest guidelines, the SIEV is able to recognize and localize a disease exhibiting a high level of disease understanding. Okay, so, so that hopefully that gave you the complexities what needs to address. This is just for cardiology. We have similar work going on in radiology imaging, breast radiology from our, so the, the project itself is a um, worldwide collaboration between several IBM research labs uh, from Armadon to Haifa Labs to Melbourne and members from the Watson Lab as well. Um, so what I'm going to end with is a demonstration of the actual medical system wherein we are trying to tell you a story about what the next generation clinical decision support might look like. Now here we've tried to bundle both radiologists and cardiologists in, in a workstation, which as you know is not going to happen anytime soon, but in order to illustrate the story. And from the point of view of uh, the system, it really doesn't matter which set of imaging it's looking at. So, so let's see. Uh, so basically the system brings in patient knowledge, clinical knowledge, 
uses a multimodal learning methodology for, from a, a variety of analytics, some of which you have seen in this, these videos, and then also does advanced clinical reasoning on it in order to do decision support. A second perspective we are taking in here, and therefore the name CIV, is the summarization of information as well in a way that is easily understood by clinicians and, uh, and represents the essential content needed for uh, differential diagnosis. So let's go to that. So the first feature in the system, assuming we have not timed out, uh, since uh, we have, okay, we may need to connect back. doesn't seem to like the internet. It may have timed out the internet. Um, okay, since the internet is timed out, it's not letting me give you a live demo. I'm going to run a video. Um, It essentially shows the stages of the system. Aims to become the cognitive assistant of it also shows you a radiology use Just case. Just as a resident assistant goes ahead of a clinician in a teaching hospital, medical C will collect hear? all relevant multimodal clinical information about the patient and pre-analyze large volumes of imaging and other data Is guided by clinical knowledge. It acts as a sieve to summarize and present all relevant clinical information for clinical decision support. This short clip demonstrates how medical sieve can assist a clinician in an emergency room setting where an experienced radiologist may not be available and the patient may present as a complex case with ambiguous signs and symptoms with insufficient history on file. A 25-year-old female is brought into the ER unconscious after a motor vehicle crash. An initial head CT and MRI are performed and lab work is ordered. The system first receives basic information from the electronic medical record on why the clinician is seeing this patient. Chief complaint received. Now the system identifies the important pieces of information for the first stage of processing. Keywords identified for automated detection of chief complaint. At each stage of the pipeline, more information is added. The system updates the list of possible diseases. These diseases are then filtered out as the probability of each diagnosis decreases. Most probable reasons for complaint identified. The system receives basic information from the electronic medical record from the past clinical interactions. Medical history received. Elevated blood pressure, previous abdominal pain, headaches, and acute confusion noted. Disease probabilities updated. A head CT is ordered to check for head trauma from the crash and automatic analysis is performed. CT image received. Original image. Multi-level thresholding. Extracting outer skull contour. Refining skull contour by convex shape partitioning. Refined segmentation. Obtaining structures, brain, skull, and hematoma. No intracranial hemorrhage. Skull intact. No fracture. Scalp hematoma. CT analysis complete. Disease probabilities updated. Main choices narrowed down to stroke, overdose, concussion, 
and press posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. An MRI is performed to identify any potential neurologic conditions and automatic analysis is performed. MRI received. Regions of increased signal identified. Neuroanatomy labeled. Abnormality localized. MRI analysis complete. Disease probabilities updated. Summarizing the findings from the analysis of the text, the past medical history, and the images, the system finds the most likely diagnosis to be posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. The medical sieve is the cognitive assistant to clinicians of the future. This system will help to speed diagnosis, provide expert opinions in small clinics, and improve remote medical care. By combining clinical knowledge and similarity with individual patient information, the medical sieve system will help improve the overall diagnostic process. Okay. All right. So going back to us here. All right, so, so hopefully that gave you enough uh, of what's coming in the future. Um, so what do I see as the challenges in clinical decision support? So getting information out of EMR systems, PAC systems and all, and integrating the data. So the data integration still proves to be a challenge, although we've tried to address it by many different mechanisms in our own work, particularly directly tapping into HL7 messaging infrastructure and DICOM infrastructure for gathering the data uh, in a transparent fashion. Um, generating of largely labeled data sets. In order to be good at these things, it is important to have large labeled data sets, and so the grand challenge of the type that Larry has been talking about are going more and more switch, uh, should come, and hospital systems and people who are in the audience from there should consider volunteering large-scale uh, data sets from, uh, for, uh, for annotation and benchmarking purposes uh, in order to advance the field. Um, we do see that there is a going to be a, a more and more other types of data coming into the field from a modality perspective. Pathology <laughs> imaging is catching on quite a bit. There's also genomic imaging uh, that is going to be playing a role as well in the combination of this with diagnostic imaging. Um, of, of course, of, uh, uh, from the point of view of actually rolling these out, there is also issues with respect to class two, class three uh, devices and the barriers that in, uh, particularly industries face in trying to get these out into the marketplace quickly. Um, finally, there is the adoption by clinicians. That's going to be the biggest challenge that we'll still face and the reason why the clinical decision support systems haven't um, you know, been very successful in, in adoptions in hospitals is uh, in, the, in their ability to fit into the clinician's workflow and uh, help rather than hinder their work, um, but also be accurate enough that they can be trusted. And, and our effort is one in such direction, but I'm sure there are others who may want to uh, look at this aspect as well. So, so here's some latest trends in pathology imaging I thought I should point out to you from work from just happening from uh, Mother Bushi's group, from our own group, from the Zurich labs, in trying to interpret uh, cancer imaging as we go along. Uh, okay, so to summarize, um, the field of clinical decision support is poised for a new realm of growth by combining the information from reasoning, machine learning, patient similarity, along with advanced diagnostic image interpretation from a community such as this. Uh, we see these trends uh, actually having a very mutually reinforcing factor so that hopefully we will get to practical clinical decision support systems uh, sometime in the future. Thank you. <laughs>